This is the boardroom of the School of History and Archives in University College Dublin. Uh, behind me is a portrait of Professor Owen McNeill, Professor of Early Irish History, including Medieval History, uh, at this university from 1909 to 1941. And that portrait uh, was painted in 1941 by Sean O'Sullivan to mark the retirement of Owen McNeill from his academic position. Well, McNeill came to public prominence in the 1890s as an Irish language activist. He was one of the instigators of the Gaelic League and would have achieved a significant public profile with that because he had the position of Secretary of the Gaelic League, which really involved crisscrossing the country, trying to build up support for this new language movement. He also would have been very involved in editing Irish language newspapers from the 1890s, which he continued um, at various stages throughout the 1890s and into the early 20th century. He was also a full-time civil servant, and this combination of his day job and his Gaelic League job certainly took a toll on his health and he had a nervous breakdown as a result of it. Uh, but nonetheless, he remained very active and very passionate about that particular subject. Uh, he was also a scholar of, of early Irish and of early Irish history, uh, and he took up the position of Professor of Early Irish History in University College Dublin, uh, the new university, in 1909. And he had also achieved prominence by campaigning actively for Irish to be a compulsory subject for matriculation into the new uh, national universities. There are also issues around this time about the status of the Gaelic League, the extent to which it can remain a non-political body. Uh, Owen McNeill was supportive of the idea that it should abandon its political neutrality. That was very strongly opposed by uh, one of the founders of the Gaelic League, Douglas Hyde, and it did lead to divisions within the, the ranks of the Gaelic League. And Owen McNeill later acknowledged that he may have been wrong in taking that particular position. Uh, but there's no doubt that he was becoming increasingly nationalistic in his uh, political outlook. Uh, and it really is in 1913, the 1st of November 1913, uh, that he begins to light the spark that ultimately led to the creation of the Irish Volunteers. He responded to the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force by penning an article called The North Began, uh, which essentially asked those in the southern part of the island to emulate the Ulster example, uh, and that ultimately led to him being approached by advanced nationalists in Dublin at that time uh, with a view to the formation of the Irish Volunteers, which was established on the 25th of November 1913 uh, at the Rotunda in Dublin. Uh, he was Chief of Staff. He was not just a front man, has, has sometimes been suggested, who was being taken advantage of. He did believe very strongly in the idea that the Irish Volunteers could become uh, a key part of a movement that would force the British government to concede home rule and to implement a home rule. And the significant thing about home rule at that stage is it's very much in abeyance. This is uh, at a time uh, when Britain is gearing up for the First World War. Uh, and that war, in turn, precipitates a split in the Irish volunteer movement. Uh, Owen McNeill was concerned uh, that John Redmond, as leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, even though Owen McNeill supported him, would not seek to control the volunteer movement because he did believe that the military and the political leadership of Irish national should be separate, but he eventually has to give in uh, to John Redmond, who insists as leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party that he should be in a commanding position uh, when it comes to the Irish Volunteers. Uh, and rather than split the movement, Owen McNeill agrees to that demand. Uh, but it's subsequently John Redmond's decision to back the, back the British war effort to the extent that he urges Irish volunteers to join the British Army uh, that provokes a split in the volunteer movement, ultimately leading to a breakaway group within the volunteers who retain the original Irish volunteer name, uh, and Owen McNeill retains his position at the head of that uh, breakaway faction. The vast majority of the Irish volunteers, who are now national volunteers, uh, remain with Redmond. But what was also going on behind the scenes at that time uh, were the actions and the plans of the more militant or more advanced nationalists and republicans who were using the volunteer movement essentially as a cover. Uh, there were individuals like Patrick Pearce uh, and uh, Eamon Kant who were members of the executive of the Irish Volunteers who were using it as a front organisation, who were busy behind the scenes trying to form um, the nucleus of what became a revolutionary group intent on staging a rising, uh, and that eventually happened uh, in 1916. Uh, 
Uh, much of that was planned in secret. Uh, it involved a fair degree of deception. It involved the deception of, of Owen McNeill. There were a variety of different conditions that he would have attached uh, to any notion of a popular revolt against uh, the British Empire at that time. He did not believe that the conditions were there in 1916. Uh, he had initially been persuaded uh, through uh, the doctoring of a document from Dublin Castle from the British administration uh, in Ireland uh, that they were about to move to disarm the Irish volunteers. There was also the promise of German assistance, German military assistance um, through the organisation of Roger Casement, who was attempting uh, to, to sponsor an initiative to bring in German arms. But when Owen McNeill discovered that he had been deceived, that the British document had been doctored, that the German arms shipment had been sunk. Uh, o McNeill was furious. He did not believe that the rising was either morally or politically or militarily justified. Uh, and history certainly remembers him for that decision, the famous countermand uh, that he issued, uh, ordering the Irish volunteers not to mobilize uh, on Easter Sunday, 1916. But a minority of them did mobilize on Easter Monday after the organizers of the planned rising decided they go, would go ahead with their plans. Now, O. McNeill obviously uh, was uh, very concerned about this, and he was also somebody who was, in the aftermath of the Easter Rising, arrested, uh, court-martialed, and sent to life imprisonment. On his return uh, from uh, those periods of incarceration, like many other uh, of those who were in prison during that time, he did become very active in the Sinn Féin movement. Uh, he became uh, very active in the anti-conscription movement in 1918, which provided Sinn Féin, uh, a newly invigorated Sinn Féin, with a platform uh, for further resistance and further organisation. And ultimately, he becomes very involved in, in that great campaign of 1918 to try and supplant and replace the Irish Parliamentary Party, the dominant constitutional nationalists, and Sinn Féin are very successful. Uh, in that regard, uh, the general election of December 1918 not only saw uh, Sinn Féin decimate the Irish Parliamentary Party, but for Owen McNeill personally it involved uh, winning um, actually two seats. Uh, he was elected as a representative uh, for Derry City, but also for the uh, National University of Ireland constituency, uh, which placed him again in the vanguard of um, an advanced nationalist movement. The big question, of course, looming at the end of 1918 is what Sinn Féin is going to do with this new mandate. Uh, and that begins the second stage uh, of, of Sinn Féin's plan uh, for a political war of independence, the meeting of the first doll in January 1919, the formation of a rival underground Sinn Féin government uh, which attempts to supplant the British administration in Ireland. Owen McNeill is very much a part of that. He's initially appointed Minister for Finance in that new Sinn Féin government. Uh, subsequently, when Michael Collins took over that position, Owen McNeill became Minister for Industries. Ultimately, he did support the treaty. He was Speaker in the Dáil in early 1922 at the time of the treaty debates. He did speak in favour of the treaty, but he was not um, permitted a vote because of his status as Speaker. He didn't vote as Speaker, but nonetheless he did support uh, the treaty. And during that very difficult period between the acceptance by the Doyle of the treaty, albeit by a very narrow margin, and the beginning of the Civil War, O. McNeill would have been one of many uh, politicians and public figures within Sinn Féin uh, who would have been adamant that there was a need to avoid a civil war. But when they felt that that was not going to be possible or when the efforts proved to be futile, he does become very much associated with the hard line that has been taken by the pro-treaty provisional government. Um, in, in those uh, early days of this fledging free state. Uh, he is somebody who is uh, very supportive of the policies of executions, the execution of Republicans during uh, the Civil War, um, and that was a stance uh, that led to him becoming um, uh, a, a great enemy uh, of the anti-treaty Republicans. Um, and he was also somebody who believed that there was an onus on that provisional government to ensure that the will of the people, as represented by the general election of June 1922, in which the pro-treaty Sinn Féin uh, party uh, received more support than the anti-treaty Sinn Féin party, that that 
choice was respected, that, that that democratic will, as he saw it, was respected. So he does become uh, something of a hardliner uh, in that particular government. He's also appointed Minister for Education, which is an interesting appointment, because he was, as we know, very much associated with uh, Irish language revival. And that becomes a cornerstone of educational policy from the 1920s onwards, right up to the 1960s. He's not necessarily a very hands-on Minister for Education in that he did believe it was primarily the role of the Catholic Church uh, to take the lead in controlling the kind of education that existed at that time and in controlling the content uh, and, and, and the teaching uh, of, of, um, of the syllabus. Uh, but nonetheless, he would have been associated with that very uh, proactive approach to the implementation uh, of Irish language teaching at all levels of the Irish education system. Um, he also became controversially associated with the Boundary Commission. Article 12 of the treaty, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, did provide for the establishment of a Boundary Commission. There was a lot of vagueness around that. Uh, it was something of a fudge uh, to try and dispense with the partition problem during the treaty negotiations. But it did come back to haunt the Free State Government. Uh, and Owen McNeill becomes, you could say something of a victim in that, and that he is the representative of the Irish government, uh, but he doesn't do himself any favours in how he approached it. Uh, there was a degree of reluctance on his part to engage uh, with his colleagues over it. Uh, and when eventually it becomes clear that there is not going to be any alteration to the border, and remember an alteration to the border was one of the arguments that was used for, for, for acceptance of the treaty, um, he decides that his position is no longer tenable. Uh, when the news leaks out that the um, a status quo is essentially going to remain in relation to partition. He does become something uh, of, of a fall guy for that government, uh, though his own arguably his own lack of engagement and his own lack of communication around it didn't help his cause. And he then essentially reverts uh, to a life within academia uh, to you know, answer the fundamental questions he was interested in as a scholar. Uh, when did Irish history begin? Uh, when could you establish uh, an Irish tradition uh, these were uh, very interesting scholarly questions, uh, and he was an effective teacher in that regard, if somewhat um, idiosyncratic. Uh, but he also devoted himself uh, to the role of preservation, the preservation uh, of historical material. He had an involvement in the Irish Manuscripts Commission, which was uh, a vital organisation uh, in terms of the preservation of historical material. He was associated with the Royal Irish Academy, the Royal uh, Society of Antiquaries uh, of Ireland, uh, very much associated with those bodies that were devoted to the uh, promotion and preservation of Irish heritage, which dovetailed very nicely uh, with his professorial role in University College Dublin as Professor of Early Irish History. Uh, and it's there he remains in UCD until 1941. Now there's no doubt in terms of the legacy, uh, particularly the, the legacy legacy of the political life of Owen McNeill, that he was very preoccupied throughout those uh, latter decades of his life with his reputation, uh, particularly with the controversy over the countermanding order that he had issued um, before the 1916 Rising. He justified that on political grounds, on moral grounds, on military grounds, um, but there was a feeling uh, that his reputation had been sullied and there had been damage done to his legacy as a result of that, because the 1916 Rising subsequently became such an iconic event was regarded very much as the, the foundation act of, uh, of, of the Irish Republic. Um, and in that sense, he, was, he felt quite aggrieved at the way uh, in which his, his reputation had been tarnished. Um, now, there was much done after his death, particularly in the 1960s and 1970s, to revisit that, to come up with some form of a reappraisal uh, of Owen McNeill's role. Um, and this received an added momentum, I think it's fair to say, by the outbreak of the Troubles in Northern Ireland after 1969, the idea that Owen McNeill could now be presented as a man of peace, uh, that the kind of messianic uh, fervour or nationalism uh, or rhetoric uh, of, of Patrick Pearce and his colleagues um, was at odds with the uh, more reasoned and rational approach of Owen McNeill, uh, and that did chime with certain uh, individuals in the 1970s and indeed in the 1980s in relation to what was happening uh, in Northern Ireland. There was also the attempt by scholars, including F.X. Martin, uh, another medieval historian, uh, to begin to publish documents 
um, that had been compiled by Owen McNeill himself, uh, which sought to justify the stance that he had taken um, in the run-up to the Easter Rising of 1916. Uh, it's quite clear uh, that he was intent on elaborating on his rationale uh, and his own justification for the decision he made in 1916. And he was adamant that Ireland at that time uh, was not a poetic abstraction, uh, that there was an irresponsibility involved uh, in staging uh, a, a rising that essentially involved some form of heroic sacrifice, not just for those who were centrally involved, but also for those who would be uh, become caught up uh, in a rising, uh, perhaps innocent victims in a rising. He did not believe that that was justified on any level. Uh, but when it comes to an overall estimation of the career and the impact and the legacy of Owen McNeill, uh, you've got to be conscious of, of the various strands uh, of, uh, of his public life and his private life, his public life particularly in terms of his role in the Irish language movement uh, and in the Gaelic League, uh, his role in the Irish volunteer movement, uh, which evolved into such uh, a significant uh, nationalist group, uh, his role um, in revolutionary Ireland as, as a member of a revolutionary government and an underground government uh, during the War of Independence, uh, his role as a strong supporter of the fledging free state as a member of the provisional government and a free state minister in the early 1920s uh, and his role in the Boundary Commission. They will all form a very important part of any historical assessment of his contribution uh, to public, like, public life. And then there is the whole question of his scholarly impact and the degree to which he forged new research uh, into uh, the whole question of, of, of early Irish history, uh, early Irish language. He was very much of the belief uh, that the greatest period of Ireland's history was that period of early Irish history when he believed the Irish were the schoolmasters of Europe, and he was very much associated with promoting uh, a recognition and a study uh, of that period. Um, and then you have the whole question of, of the uh, impact and the legacy uh, of, of his scholarship for subsequent generations uh, of scholars and of students. So there's a very interesting mix in the life of Owen McNeill, there is that educational dimension, there is that organisational uh, dimension, and there is that strong and controversial political dimension. Uh, and you would hope that at this time, the centenary of the formation of the Irish Volunteers, that there would be an appreciation for the multi-layered life that Owen McNeill had, and indeed the multi-layered interpretations of his impact and legacy.